order. Tammy, Tammy, can you go ahead and um, start with the roll call, please? You betcha. So as I call your name, if you could just say here or present or something, that'd be great. Uh, Ken Houston. Here. Mm -hmm, thanks, Ken. Wes Lowry. Here. Kevin Bowden. Here. Jason Elkins. Here. Nelson Tipton. Here. Francie Jaffe. Francie, can you hear us? Ah, I had my mute on in the wrong spot, which I always fiddle with it. Here, I am here. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, David Bell? Here. Uh, Todd Williams? Here. Scott Hallwick? Here. Tom Duster? Here. Allison Gould? Here. Roger Lang? Here. Marsha Martin? Here. Chair, I believe we have a quorum. Great. Thank you, Tammy. The next item is approval of the previous month's minutes um, for November 15th, 2021. Are there any comments, questions on those meeting minutes? If not, we need a motion for approval. I move to approve, Mr. Chair. There's a motion. Is there a second? Allison is the second. Um, any other further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, looks like that motion passes unanimously. Thank you. So the next item, item four, is the water status report. Wes, are you handling that? Nelson will do that uh, for us. Okay, I'm sorry, Nelson, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so today, the flow on the St. Brain Creek at the Lion's Gauge is 17 CFS. The 124-year uh, average um, is 15 CFS for this date. The call on the St. Brain Creek is currently Highland number two uh, reservoir. Admin number is 11,642 uh, with a priori priority date of November 15th, 1881. Call on the main stem of the South Platte River is Riverside Reservoir. Admin number 21,698 with a priority date of May 29th. 1909. There's no call below uh, Riverside Reservoir Headgate. Um, so St. Brain Basin storage the beginning of the month is at approximately 67% uh, percent of average. Um, Rife, Ralph Price Reservoir at Button Rock Preserve is at 6,376.3 feet, which is equivalent to 11,450 acre feet. Um, it's down about uh, 4,700 acre feet from full and we are currently releasing 25 CFS. So Union Reservoir is down approximately a thousand acre feet and releasing about uh, seven CFS and it's uh, if you guys have anybody's been out there and seen it it's it's uh, frozen over completely. So um, so it's, that's about it. I think most everybody saw that the, uh, we had some snow events the uh, on the the end of December, the first week of uh, of January, which raised the snowpack for uh, both the South Platte River Basin and the Colorado River Basin, which was good news for us. Uh, Wes will go ahead and he'll go and uh, detail that on another item. It's going to be uh, yeah, I wrote it down. It'll be on 9D on our water supply update. So that's all I have. Is there any questions? Any questions for Nelson? Excellent. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Nelson. All right. I'm on to item five, which is public invited to be heard and special presentations. Tammy, do we have either of those? No, nothing today. Okay. All right, um, we'll keep moving. Item six, Ken, are there any agenda revisions or submission of documents? We have none. Okay. Item seven is development activity. Um, Wes, there's no development activity, is that correct? That is correct. All right, moving right along. Um, <clears throat> item eight, um, 8A is a designation of posting place for board uh, meeting notices. Wes, do you wanna? go over that real quick. 
Yes. Um, so as the board will recall, um, last year, the city attorney's office recommended that water board uh, designate the primary location of its official designated posting place on the city's website. Um, we're recommending that again this year. And then also in accordance with kind of the Colorado Sunshine Law um, and as a backup location in case an emergency like a power outage, um, recommending that water board designate um, the um, lobby area outside the service center as the location for posting uh, the physical agenda. So it'll be, uh, so everything would be exactly the same as last year. And that's the recommendation. Okay. Are there any questions for Wes on, on the designation of the posting place for the board meeting notices? Not hearing any, and I, I've got the agenda up on um, my screen. I cannot see everybody, so feel free to chime in if, if you do have a comment. Um, if there are no comments, we need a, a motion um, to approve the recommended uh, meeting notice locations on the city's website as a primary and the bulletin board and the service center as a secondary location. I would so move, Jeremy. Okay, we have a motion by Allison. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Tom. Any further discussion? I can see everybody now and I don't see any further discussion. So all those um, uh, in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Go ahead and raise your hand if you can. Okay, um, that motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, item 8B is the Union Reservoir Land Acquisition Program, the Kelleher parcel, Ken. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, wanted to bring up the uh, map on page 15 of your packet. Um, it's kind of easiest to see uh, at this point where, um, where the parcel is and, and how it fits in. Um, just a little bit of history about the, the Union Reservoir Land Acquisition Program. Um, City Council initially directed staff to um, initiate a land acquisition program around Union Reservoir in the mid-1990s. So we've been working on this about 25 years now. As you can see from this map, um, we've obtained a significant amount of the property around the reservoir. There's, there's really multiple reasons that this land acquisition um, has moved forward over the years. The, the first and obvious reason is to protect the area around the reservoir from development to ensure that in the future, um, when Longmont wants to enlarge the reservoir, um, that we're, we're, we don't have a large development uh, around the reservoir that we have to um, address, um, and that and it's been very successful at, at doing doing that very thing. Um, the second thing we want wanted to do was, um, you know, a lot of the reservoirs on the on the plains, the front range here, um, obviously, the neatest place to live is right around on the shore of a reservoir. So um, they tend to get fairly high development activities. And as a result, um, high um, nutrient loads from and pollution loads from stormwater runoff from developed areas into the, into the um, reservoirs, uh, which exacerbate water quality issues. Um, as a result, our secondary uh, goal here is to just simply protect the shoreline around the reservoir from uh, immediate impacts from development. This program does both of those. Um, the, third, the third thing we really wanted to do is to be able to um, buttress and, and expand upon our recreational activities out in the Union Reservoir area. Uh, and, and you need to kind of uh, develop the area to do that. And I'll talk about that one second. And then finally, the north side of the reservoir um, is operated a little bit. Um, while we do allow uh, boating on the surface of the reservoir, um, there's a lot of um, unique um, wildlife 
uh, area up there as well. Um, and so a lot of reasons that we've, we've done the land acquisition program. Um, currently the city is, um, city council, in fact, a few years ago, um, directed staff to proceed with a uh, perimeter trail around the reservoir um, that's been in the works really for about, planned for about 20 years. Um, it was even um, initially uh, started scoping it out um, and then it was kind of put on hold about four or five years ago um, to, to give staff time to to meet with some of the residents around the reservoir and try to address some concerns there. But more recently, it's been determined, um, staff's had direction to, to continue to do that development. Um, one of the things on the west side of County Line Road 1, Spring Gulch number two trail system has been constructed and actually goes down to the entrance area of Union Reservoir. And if you look on the map here on parcel L um, on the southwest side of the reservoir, um, the, the trail goes right through the middle of parcel L. And so the, there's a, a short, just a short spur off that trail and you're to the, to the west shoreline of Union Reservoir. And so the first phase of the Union Reservoir trail will be from parcel L up to parcel D and then across the road to tie in Jim Ham Pond with the Spring Gulch number two trail and create that, that Western link on the west side. Um, again, if you look at this map, there's only two parcels we do not own uh, and that's parcel E, Kalahar parcel, and parcel J, um, which is owned by the uh, Willis family. We do, however, as part of a outside water tap that was approved um, a number of years ago by uh, Water Board and Council, um, we did obtain as part of that outside water tap, granting that outside water tap, an easement across that property for the trail. So really the last parcel of property that we need to get across um, is parcel E. So acquisition of parcel E will not only further the Union Reservoir enlargement and the Union protecting the, the shoreline of Union Reservoir, but it'll also create that last link uh, for that Eastern Perimeter Trail. Eventually, um, councils ask us to, you know, get a trail in around the entirety of the reservoir. Uh, if, you can, if you can think of the trail around Lake McIntosh, the, the citizens love it. I mean, that's, that's one of the jewels of the places um, between the uh, three or four places really around town that, that the citizens really like um, those perimeter trails or one of them. So we know that's a, an added benefit for this parcel. Um, the, the current owner, Mr. Kelleher, um, unfortunately passed away, I believe last summer sometime. Um, and so the estate is um, putting the property on the market. Um, we feel it would go quite quickly. <laughs> it's, it's a very desirable parcel, a, a very nice large house on it with uh, direct um, frontage all the way down up to the edge of the, not the reservoir, but the Union Reservoir Company property, um, but you know, fairly close to the shoreline. So uh, very desirable parcel. Um, our, our hope would be to, um, so the, the um, executor for the estate first approach the city and ask us, hey, do you have an interest in, in buying this before I put it on the market? And we said, yes, <laughs> it, it fits right in with the other, all the other parcels that we've purchased are around the reservoir. So we're, at this point, um, staff is, is recommending that we mm -hmm. proceed with an acquisition. The acquisition will be around uh, $1.5 million, but the bulk of the value of the property is the actual house. And we would um, hope to do similar to what we have. If you look right below it on parcel F, G, and H, um, we don't own those houses. We just own the uh, undeveloped property um, east of the, from east, just east of the houses down to the pro um, Union Reservoir Company property line. So that's what we would probably eventually do with this particular property is 
split that, subdivide that into two parcels. Um, and then we could then um, dispose of, sell, or have uh, another um, action and uh, opportunity for managing the house and the remaining property. Um, we, um, we have completed the phase one environmental audit. We've completed the ALTA survey. We have the um, appraisal um, hopefully due about the end of this month. So uh, most of the diligence work is done. The, uh, uh, the phase one environmental audit came back clean uh, as did the ALTA. So we're pretty comfortable with the parcel property that we have. And so at this point, um, staff is recommending uh, rec that the water board uh, forward a recommendation to city council um, to approve the um, sales contract. Uh, functionally, how we do it is the city and the uh, uh, state will uh, enter into that sales contract. Then that sales contract will go to city council. If they approve it, the, the sales contact contract becomes effective and then we would then close um, a few weeks after the council meeting. Um, currently hoping to close about the end of February uh, on this parcel property. So we'd be happy to answer any questions more broadly about the Union Reservoir Enlargement Program uh, or specifically about this particular parcel of property. Thanks, Ken. Are there any questions on the uh, proposed acquisition? Once again, I there we go. Now I can see everybody. Um, Roger, we'll start with you and then go to Scott. Okay, uh, Ken, with the uh, purchase of this parcel, what other areas uh, will prevent us from doing a, a path? Is, is like parcel J, is that is that going to be obstructing <coughs> any creation yeah. path around? Um, yeah, let, let us bring the uh, map back up again and I can kinda, kinda go around um, the properties. So parcel, parcel J is the one owned by the Willis family, which we have a, an easement across. So we won't be prevented. The easement is right along the shoreline. So um, currently we would have to construct a trail. Um, and we'd probably do it like a crusher fine, like on the west half of Lake McIntosh. Um, and it would be fairly close to the shoreline. It may or you know may or may not be where the final trail alignment. We don't have a final trail alignment yet. That that, that planning process will occur um, this spring and and summer. Um, so we, that that process um, is just starting. Um, as you go around the reservoir, um, there there really aren't uh, any other areas. That that you we couldn't fit a trail in. Uh, we don't own parcel A, the, the the dashed parcels, parcel A, or U or T. If we wanted the if the trail happened to fall on the north side of Weld County Road 28, I don't think it will. But you know I, I don't want to presume where it's going to be till the planning. More than likely it'll be on the south side of Road 28 there. Um, or maybe the shoulder, who knows? Um, the, you know, all those options will be looked at. But pretty much all the way around the reservoir, we, we, we either own the property or we can fit the trail on the Union Reservoir Company property. Um, it, one interesting part is at parcel D, the plan is to take the trail up to Weld County Road 1. Um, my thought is we'll probably jump across Weld County Road 1 to Jim Ham Pond, go north to 28, and then come back across the road at 28. But we may not want two road crossings on that trail. Um, there really isn't a good way to go across parcel C, which is between B and D, um, because of a very large wetland area that is probably one of the more critical wildlife areas out there. So if we don't cross County Line Road 1, I could see us probably going on the east side of 1, um, just basically paralleling County Road 1 up to County Road 28, and then back east. Um, 
that might require, depending on how you, the trail alignment would go, you might want to try to get a, slight, a small amount of additional right away because it's pretty tight on County Line Road 1. You don't want your trail too close to the road. That's the only place I could see. But, but the short answer is um, if we get parcel E, um, th there is a way to design the trail, even if parts of it are temporary trail, all the way around the reservoir and get that complete. Okay. Okay, thanks, Ken. Scott? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, new guy question, Ken. Um, I, I can appreciate with the nexus to the union enlargement project where, where the water board would be weighing in, but this is more of a parks and recreation element to me. And I was just curious why, why it's before us specifically. Um, yeah, that's that's uh, the the property will actually be. I mean, it's going to be owned by the city of Longmont. All all the property is owned by the city. I, you know, I get that, um, but the actual um, fund that will, will manage the property will be the water department. It will also be um, the funding will come from the water department. So um, because it's for the enlargement of the reservoir. Um, you know, I, I, I bring in the trail because this particular acquisition fits so well with the trail. It also fits with the city's overall kind of open space buffering the east side of Longmont. But the primary purpose of the acquisition is for the enlargement of Union Reservoir. It'll be paid for by, and, and whenever you, what, whichever fund kind of pays for property that's recording in progress settlements that were filed with the court but uh okay is hey, there hey, other thanks, questions Jim. yeah no I, I generally support it i just didn't understand the the funding element so that makes a lot more sense thank you okay okay any other questions i i do have a couple can or allison why don't you and marcia go and then i'll i can go last go ahead allison uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize. I don't have a question on this specific matter. However, as I advised staff earlier, I have a previous commitment that I need to step away for. So okay. I apologize. I'm going to have to go. Um, so thank you all. Hope you have a great rest of your meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Marcia. Um, yeah, uh, Ken, can you, do you know where the house is? I'm thinking in terms of, is it going to be easy or hard to... Uh, subdivide the property and sell the house? It will, the house is about one third the way down the property from County Line Road 1. It will be real, real easy to subdivide it. Almost, we'll, we'll go identically north of the other three parcels that are on the south side of it. Um, so that part, um, that part will be real easy. That won't be a problem at all. Thank you very much, Ken. Ken, I've got a related question to that. If I read the write up in the, well, the agreement, purchase draft purchase agreement, it's going to be subject to a lease. Um, did it sound like that house was going to be potentially leased back to someone in that family? And I guess, where's that at? Because that may impact the value, may just want to make sure it all fits within what you're describing as in terms of the long-term use, it seems like that needed to be played out at the same time the contract is. Um, yes, a very good point. Actually, as um, we will enter into, so part of the negotiations for the acquisition of the property, um, the owner's son was, li was living in the house and, and continues to live in the house today. So part of the negotiation was to allow him to kind of have time to sort out his finances and acquire another parcel of property. Plus, we don't want to buy it and then immediately have an empty house. So part of the negotiations is he'll have for a three year lease um, and that lease will actually be entered into um, coterminously with this agreement. The, the, the lease has already been negotiated and so it's ready to sign as soon as we sign the contract. It takes three, three, about three years for us to run a subdivision process through the normal 
city subdivision process and then get something, you know, a management decision made on what to do with the house. And then if we want to sell it, it would take some time to sell it. So we feel actually that doesn't hurt um, at all. It, it keeps the, the house properly managed and, and a tenant in it um, while we're um, working through the, the legal parts of getting a subdivision done. Okay, thank you. That, that helps fill a gap that I had. Um, if you go back to the map, Ken, the, the one, I guess, question going through my mind, there's a few private entities and then is the green or the blue, I'm sorry, kind of a blue line and then it's kind of black dash line on the um, south side of the property. Is that what the potential high water mark of the um, Union Reservoir expansion would be? Am I seeing that right? Yes, the, uh, the black dashed line on the southwest side of the reservoir and then the east side of the reservoir is the dam embankment for the highest raise option. Um, I see. Our, our filing is 21 foot, but when we looked, did the um, in engineering, 19 foot is physically kind of the best you could do out there. So that's a 19 foot raise. And then the red dash line is just where the 19 foot raise shoreline would be. Uh, and then the blue line as part of the negotiations with the reservoir company going clear back into the 1980s, um, we're, putting, we're putting a reservoir on top of their reservoir and their property. So we have to dedicate this property, the enlarged reservoir property to the company, as well as replicate. Currently they have on the average of 50 foot buffer high above the high water line to where their property line is. So we have to replicate that to the reservoir company. Um, so on the north side of the reservoir, the blue line is simply where we would dedicate um, the extent of the dedication of the property to the reservoir company. Okay. The, the one thing that's kind of standing out to me is the far north end. It looks like there's a bunch of parcels that potentially would be impacted. Um, is that right? And are those also areas that the city would ultimately need to um, acquire or get, you know, to be able to expand um, the reservoir to, to this level? It is, yeah, there's, there's uh, three large parcels, parcel A, U, and T on the north side that um, really are the last kind of uh, three, well, with Willis's parcel J on the west. Those four parcels are really the last four big ones. Um, and then if you're looking up, up the uh, uh, gulch to the north of A and Z, there's a whole bunch of small parcels up there and it's not decided exactly how um, that how that'll look will depend on the design of the dam when it's done. Uh, it's possible that we'll have an embankment through there um, for the relocated County Road 28 and we might not go up there with uh, with the water might you know might might just have an embankment might put an embankment in and, and leave water up there. We've, we've told those, those property owners have talked to us for years about how that's gonna look. And, you know, so that, that part hasn't been decided yet, whether we'll need to acquire that or not. But the three big ones on the north side, yeah. That's the last three of all the properties around the reservoir that we need to acquire. And two of them, A and T are owned by the same family, the Dochef Dairy. And, and we've had a number of conversations with them over the years. Okay. All right, that was, those were the questions I had. Any further questions for Ken on this? And I, once again, can't see everybody here. There we go. Any other comments, questions? I'm not seeing any so, Ken, you need a, a motion um, for the recommendation to council on the uh, acquisition of the property. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, with that being said, does someone want to make the motion 
um, uh, for a recommendation to city council for the acquisition of the Kelleher parcel at Union Reservoir. Roger. I second Roger's motion, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I, I so moved, I was muted for a while. Uh, <laughs> well, we had the second jump the first, but- Yeah, well, that's a good job, uh, Scott. Uh, <laughs> I was lip reading, Roger. Second, any further discussion? <laughs> I'm not seeing any. Um, all those in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 All right, so that passes unanimously. Thank you, Ken. Um, <clears throat> so next item is 8C, which is the cash and lieu review, Ken. Yes, um, thank you again, Mr. Chair. Um, I think we've been um, looking at this with with Water Board for a little while now. As you may recall, the last time we uh, forwarded a recommendation for sending the cash and loot to uh, City Council, um, we had increased the price of cash and loot to account for um, in, uh, some <coughs> small increases in the, in the price, the cost of the Windy Gap firming project. And at that time and currently, the cash and loot is set um, based primarily on the cost of the Windy Gap firming project. Um, we've, we've, uh, we've utilized a number of different met metrics over the years. Um, years, for a number of years from the late 1980s up, up until about 2013, we used uh, the price of CBT um, as, the as, as a metrics for uh, cash and lieu, of course, that um, quickly went out of went out of range <laughs> for us, um, uh, which is when we then started looking at um, other projects as alternatives to that, and and uh, settled on the uh, Windy Gap firming project. Uh, councils asked us to seriously reconsider that and look hard at um, what we do. We've had, I believe, enough conversations um, that staff, um, the short answer right now is staff is recommending that we base cash and lieu upon a full um, wet acre foot of water basis. Um, that's uh, similar to what a lot of other cities do. Um, although a lot, of, a lot of water providers use CBT, which is in and of itself, uh, a full project in, in that CBT has the underlying water right. It has the project that was constructed. It has robust storage in the project and what East Slope uh, delivery facilities, which deliver the water um, to the consumers, uh, including Longmont. So CBT, while it is a good um, full project basis, um, and, and many, especially rural domestics, use that as their sole source because that's their only source of water. Um, luckily, Longmont has a number of, of alternatives and um, which makes our system more robust. As a result, um, at the current time, staff is, is going to recommend a water board that we use the Windy Gap project, the entire project, um, as a basis for that uh, uh, recommendation. Uh, the Windy Gap, what I call the parent project or the, the diversion and, and, and uh, pumping project that was constructed in 1985 on the West Slope, um, there are allotment contracts for that project independent of the Windy Gap firming project. Um, the only thing that project didn't build when it was being constructed was the storage component of the overall Windy Gap project. So really the diversion and, and pumping project plus the Windy Gap firming project for storage uh, created, creates the combined um, full story, full project that delivers wet water um, to the citizens of Longmont. Uh, the Windy Gap diversion and pumping project, while it originally um, only cost us a little over six, seven thousand dollars an acre foot to construct. 
um, its current value right now is about $30,000 an acre foot. And then the Windy Gap firming project, as we know from our recent cash and loose settings, about $18,500 an acre foot to firm up um, that parent project. So between the two, the $30,000 for the parent project and the $18,500 for the firming project, um, that forms the basis of our recommendation of going to $48,500 for the um, cash and lieu price, utilizing Windy Gap project as the metrics. Um, if you go to uh, page 28 of your packet, uh, I'll, I'll go real quickly through how we get to some of our, our numbers. The, um, how, and probably the biggest is how, how do we get 30,000 uh, dollars? Really two ways um, we got there. The first was that uh, if, you, if you look at some current sales of Windy Gap uh, parent, the um, Platte River Power Authority, they originally acquired 160 units from Fort Collins, Loveland and Estes Park. And of those 160, their board directed them to sell 60 of them and retain 100. Um, it partially reflects the fact that they're going um, to, in the future, more renewable sources that won't use as much water. They still use a lot of water, so they still are keeping on to 100 units. But um, the, uh, the, the units they're able to, to dispose of, the, the most recent sales were a couple years ago, December of 2020, they sold five units for two. 2,000 or 2,700,000 uh, per unit, which at 100 acre foot per unit, that comes down to $27,000 a unit. Um, if you adjust that based upon the um, Bureau of Reclamation's construction cost index for um, dams and pumping facilities, which they have good data for, that made it $29,000. Uh, $900, so right at $30,000. And then the second option is the uh, Platte River Power Authority has 10 more units. They've sold 50 of the 60. They have 10 more units that they're going to put on the market. Um, five units that are going to put on the market this spring. And they are going to um, list, they're going to take bids for it, but they're going to list a minimum bid of $30,000 per unit. Um, so we feel there's real good between those two um, activities, um, we feel there's a real good justification for utilizing $30,000 a unit for the uh, parent project for the Windy Gap Diversion and Pumping Project. And then the 18,500, we're, I believe we're all familiar with that. That's our actual sunk costs, um, uh, our actual bid, the bid cost and what we have uh, forwarded funding up to Northern Water. Um, there's still luckily some uh, contingency funding left in that project. So we're certainly hopeful that um, we're, we're doing well with that price. Um, that will of course have to be looked at um, in the future uh, as we look at our quarterly. Um, uh, the good news is uh, I think you probably saw on the, uh, uh, the firming project report that uh, the foundation's been dug, cleaned, um, grouted, and some of the plant at the bottom of the, of the reservoir dam footprint has already been constructed. You know, and during any reservoir project dam construction, your biggest, most critical point is getting the foundation dug and not having surprises. <laughs> so um, there were, you know, there there were a, a few, there were some, you know, obvious differences from what the geotechnical did and what it looked like when it was opened up, but nothing, um, nothing big. So um, we're, we're still, we're still uh, very optimistic about that project moving forward and, and going on. And then uh, finally, we also have uh, in, in your packet a comparison 
of a lot of the front range uh, water providers. We have a spreadsheet that shows that. Again, I always caution everybody, everybody, everybody's situation is different. Everybody's um, calc how they calculate and, and what they do with cash and lieu is different. So I, I, I always suggest don't, don't only, you know, don't, don't look at that as kind of, and kind of compare it because it's really apples and oranges when you compare. Um, although, you know, some of them, uh, some of them have similar um, as we do, but it's good information. Um, real quick uh, update on the, uh, one of the things as part of this process, Water Board had asked us to um, come back and report on is the uh, Piesco uh, trade. Um, as, you, as you may recall, a portion of our future water supply is based upon um, the public service company trade. We have had um, additional meetings with public service and, and phone calls and, and conversations. Um, our, our most recent, uh, we, we, we've, we actually sent public service company a written request for a, 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 either an extension or, or to make permanent part or all of the uh, trade. Um, they have taken that up, up, kind of up their chain and it turns out um, their company does not believe they can enter into a permanent exchange. Uh, was, was kind of the first really for them and for us to, to feel that. So not that um, they, they certainly reiter, reiter, reiterated it was extremely important in their um, future water supply planning and um, they're planning, they're very happy with the agreement and they don't intend on um, uh, stepping out of it anytime soon. Um, we will probably, they, they do believe we might be able to extend the term and possibly extend the, the opt-out uh, provision, provision uh, timing. Right now it's a 15 year opt-out. Well, it said, we've never heard of anything that long. And I says, well, we don't want it that short. <laughs> so you can, you can see, uh, you know, two, two different entities can look at the same thing a little bit differently. But that is, that is uh, something that is, we believe is safe and secure, but um, does not appear at this point um, that we would be able to make it permanent, which we, you know, uh, thought. So that probably makes uh, our water supply planning even more important. And um, it probably makes the Union Reservoir humpback pipeline uh, more important to maintain diligence on that and think it through and get it right. And so one of the things we, we weren't able to get all the information for today's meeting, but we'll, we'll try to commit um, for the March, the next quarterly review is March. We'll try to commit to have uh, better, uh, more well-developed robust numbers on that pump back pipeline for water board to review and look at at that time. Uh, so really the, the biggest thing we're, we're asking water board to kind of consider now is whether or not you, um, you agree or what it would recommend to council that we shift our focus on cash and lieu to a full project basis, um, wet water um, from water right to, to delivery water to the system um, and if that is the case, then we believe right now the best metrics we have is the, is the Windy Gap Farming Project at 48,500. So we still have a lot of information in the packet for you. Um, one of the other things we included was the city of Fort Collins's. Um, they recently um, went, ironically, Fort Collins um, for years, probably three decades, was lower than Longmont. They, they, their cash and loo was... 6,500 uh, and we were, we went from the 7,000 up to about 18,500 and they were still at 6,500 and they were for years and years. Um, they essentially about, you know, three, four, five years ago went to a project basis um, like we're looking at also. And when they looked at theirs, they went up into the, they were in the $40,000 range and then they, uh, and they've been looking at their uh, Halligan Reservoir enlargement. They, they, of course, they don't own any Windy Gap, 
so they didn't participate in the Windy Gap firming project. Um, they, they, car they carriage Windy Gap for PRPA through their system, but they don't own any units themselves. So their future water supply was really kind of based upon the Halligan project, which, uh, you know, unfortunately for them uh, is in the permitting process. <laughs> and as they are going through that federal permitting process, they're finding some fairly significant cost drivers in their project as well. So when they looked at the, at the that cost plus um, some system improvements they needed and some uh, some base native basin water rights, they kind of looked at all of that together. Um, and then that's how they came up. They recently went from the 40,000 range to the $60,000 range. Little bit different for Fort Collins in that they include some of their system, um, which we don't. Um, we have we have that in our water, our tap fee, and a windy gap surcharge. So little, it doesn't directly compare. But Fort Collins was a similar size city that um, had a very good um, evaluation and good process that they were following. So. Anyway, that's, uh, that's kind of the information we have for you. Um, we're, we're more than happy to try to get additional information. Um, I guess staff would suggest that we maybe look at uh, uh, setting a cash and loop fee today, recommendation to council, knowing that in March, we'll have another quarterly review. And if there's any additional information, uh, we'd be happy to bring that uh, and uh, continue to move forward. So um, at this point, I'll, I'll also open it to Wes. Wes has been integrally involved in helping us uh, put all this information together. And Wes and Nelson both um, have spent a lot of time getting, getting this information together. So if, any, if either of you have any additional information you'd like to throw out right now, if, if not, I'll open it up to Water Board for questions or, or uh, possible direction on uh, moving forward with cash and lieu recommendation. Yeah, I don't have any additional, just ready to take questions. Hey, Nelson, do you have anything? Oh, I don't have anything. Okay. Um, I'll open up to questions. Roger, look like you had your hand in it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a couple questions. Can the, um, the, back to the public service thing, and I don't want to belabor it, but can you refresh us on the current expiration dates on that agreement? Um, it was a, go ahead, Nelson. No, I, I, I was trying to think of the exact date, uh, 20, is it 2080? Yeah, it was I a 75 year uh, and we entered it in 2009. So it's yeah. 2080, two, three, four, something like okay. that. It's all, so your comment about talking to public service about doing a permanent or an extension, your thoughts were to extend it beyond 2080. Is that where you were going with that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, at, at the least, we had like to reinitiate a 75 year period. So that would, that would put it about the turn of the century, 2095 or 2100. <laughs> uh, we, would, we could even go longer if they would go longer. We can do a hundred year one. Um, we, we really have, we really settled on a 75 year. That was, that was when we did, because that was um, the, the, the longest period that public service company had an appetite for at the time. And so, uh, yeah, that's, we had hoped to, we really, what we're really focusing in on is the 15 year opt out. We would like to extend that to 25 to 50 years. So are you, what, what's, their, what's their reaction to an extension or do you know? Um, their water resources staff, whose primary job is to get water for them, <laughs> uh, Definitely wants it. Um, unfortunately, you know they're a large corporation that um, answers to a board of directors in many Minneapolis, Minnesota. I think, 
uh, out of state who doesn't quite have the um, appreciation for Western water. And, and so that's really their, their difficulty is, is convincing the corporate corporation, out of state corporation. Okay. To go longer. All right. Well, thank you. There are other, um, Tom, go ahead. Yeah, thank, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. So um, I, I'm going to ask a question that seems kind of flippant and may, maybe I just am trying to kind of get my head around some of these things. So the, 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 the sale, the upcoming sale of Windy Gap project allotment contracts, are we, we're, are we in the market for any of that or are we, that, that's just going to happen and we're not participating in that, right? Uh, we certainly would have, in fact, we actually have the second right of refusal uh, if we wanted to purchase those. The, the original first right of refusal, Platte River Power Authority has to ask Fort Collins, Loveland, and Estes Park if they would like to buy them back. That's, that's where they got them. And so we, had, you know, and that's where it should be. All three of those entities have said no, they don't want it. They then have to ask Longmont if Longmont wants to purchase it. And then if we don't want to purchase it, um, which we won't, um, then it will go um, onto the sort of a quasi open market. It, you know, it has to be within the Northern boundaries. It has to be within the municipal subdistrict boundaries. Um, you know, it, it, it can't just go anywhere. But but it it, it can go. Um, we would probably would not be in the market for it primarily because we have um, excess parent project water that we did not firm as part of the firming project, and um, is not really considered part of our what is our firm yield of our our system, and so. Before we would buy more parent project water, we would want to do something like the Union Reservoir Enlargement or other projects to firm our unfirmed portion of the project. So, sure. um, so, so I get maybe, oh, sorry, Ken, I didn't mean that. I was gonna say, we're the last full one sixth participant in the project. We're the only participant that still has all uh, of our original Windy Gap allotments, units. Okay. So I guess, I, I mean, I've, I've probably brought this up maybe a few too many times, maybe I'm not sure, but uh, I guess what I'm trying to wrap my head around is this concept of like next incremental cost, right? And that, and that that's like the basis or the foundation for our cash in lieu. And I'm just wondering like, if we are not gonna be in the market for this, for, for these contracts, right? Are that is that really our next incremental cost, or is the next incremental cost a, a more realistic project? Like I don't know, something like the Union Pump Back or something. I mean, I could kind of justify, at least in my mind, this concept of like the the next incremental cost being kind of associated with this project that is being built, right? Like the firming the firming part of this, right? Um, I'm having a harder time maybe thinking about basing our next incremental cost on a project, on shares in a project that was built 30 years ago now that that perhaps we were not necessarily, is not a, is not a realistic solution for our future, I guess, right? Like, so I don't know, any, any maybe, maybe it's a comment, but maybe any thoughts about that? Am I just not wrapping my head around this concept or maybe I'm being too kind of uh, maybe I'm holding on to this concept of next incremental costs too much perhaps I don't know yeah no I, I think that's a really good point and that's really why um, what we're trying to do is is be clear that we're not using the windy gap project as as the quote next project we're gonna do or the incremental cost but really we're using as, as a metrics for that project, um, primarily because CBT is too expensive to use as a metrics. Um, 
Windy Gap is a project that is part of it's being built now, but part of it's being sold. So it's real dependable numbers. Um, we do believe we can get better numbers for the um, like the Union Reservoir enlargement and the pump back. We just don't have those yet. And as soon as we do, um, Water Board may choose to either use that totally or, or partially or at, you know, average it with Windy Gap. Um, the, you know, other, other projects certainly could. Um, in the past, we've put a little weight on water conservation, but our problem is, again, that's, that's certainly not why we can calculate um, theoretical yield of certain prod, um, components. It, 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 that gets a little more difficult to do. Um, but certainly could. Uh, we just felt the Windy Gap project is kind of also in the middle of the road, you know, much less than CBT, but a little bit more than uh, Union and Pump Back will come out or water conservation, those things. So if you kind of, if you kind of look at the whole picture, all the way from water conservation to CBT, you're, you're still going to fall somewhere in the middle, um, which is where Windy Gap is. So that's that's why we're, we tried to, put, you know, think of it as a metrics to compare to rather than the project that we would spend money on. Yeah, so it's just a more of a, a proxy for for what we expect the future data to look like it's just a project to cost yeah yeah marcia did you have a comment or question yes and and i apologize i was forced to take an emergency call in the middle of this discussion um so if i'm running over old ground I'm sorry, but I have to ask. It sounds like your discussion is trying to keep the price as low as possible and or as low as can be justified. And uh, I don't understand why that is, especially since the rest of the policymakers um, are tending to um, push things, you know, and, and I don't mean the policymakers like the city council, although I do mean that, but also city planning, the people that are um, re revising the, the comprehensive plan are looking at increasing the density of, of population in, in Longmont in you know, doing, doing infill development that is much more dense than what the last planning was. And so um, I, I mean, it seems to me that we should be, um, have our thumbs on the scales in, in favor of people bringing actual water rights and uh, into the city. And if they're not, then um, having to pay a lot for it so that we can go out and buy it somewhere else. So uh, I hate to upset the whole discussion by asking that question, but I just did. No, I, actually, that's that's a that's a very good point, and uh, and certainly uh, starts to, for, at least for staff, we feel it starts to fall a little bit in the policy realm, but certainly we have, you know, we we have or will have soon the data. Um, the, uh, as you may remember back when we were setting, um, previously setting the uh, cash and loop price, the lowest of all the prices was water conservation. It was coming in around $10,000 an acre foot. Um, certainly um, if we wanted to derive more of our water supply from water conservation, um, that price is going to go up quite a bit because we're right now we're kind of picking all the low hanging fruit. The, the you know and, and it only makes sense. Do the water conservation programs that that 
or the most effective and least cost per acre foot, but to, to go further and further, um, it gets increasingly more expensive. Um, we certainly could bring that information back. I guess what I was trying to describe was that we feel um, we, we certainly weren't trying to go to the lower, you know, the, the least cost would be something like a button rock enlargement, which has the water right, has the enlargement and has the capability to deliver it directly to our system. Um, that price is gonna be in the $20,000 per acre foot range. Uh, but we haven't done a federal permitting for that. And a federal permitting process could greatly change that <laughs> price as Fort Collins found out with Halligan. Um, mm -hmm. You know, our, our another good, uh, in, you know, value, valuable project um, would be the Union Reservoir Enlargement and Pumpback Pipeline, which again is, is that's going to come in the high 20s low 30s, still well below the 48,000 we're talking now. Um, that's why we proposed a project that was kind of in the middle. And the only other project that I could think of that would come in higher would be um, the CBT. And there's mm -hmm. absolutely, as a policy, certainly could say, I want to use CBT as a metric. And then you're talking 70 to 80,000 dollars an acre foot mm -hmm. um, for it, which again, um, I, I have no problem with that policy being made either. A um, little less defendable, um, be, be mostly because in our past planning documents, we've said CBT is so expensive, we probably don't, we did not, uh, we affirmatively said in our raw water master planning processes that we mm -hmm. weren't gonna go get CBT because of its high cost. And, and so it gets, you know, my only caution is we'd have to, I, I believe we'd have to talk with our legal department to make sure um, that's defendable. I believe it is because I believe it's within the context of a, a fee. Um, I, we, we really believe we're telling you, you know, the lower range and the upper range of what is, is a legally defensible fee. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, if if uh, if we were to recommend forty eight thousand now, and council, um, you know, wanted us to use either another metric or or maybe a combination of all of them, you know, both Windy mm -hmm. Gap and CBT, you know, that that would put you in the sixties, and that mm -hmm. might be a, a, a very good um, policy decision too. So, yeah, we're we're That's not trying to. Cut it low. <laughs> okay. No. Well, and that's fine. And I, like I said, I was I was missing a chunk of the discussion, and and I didn't want to force you to recap any more than you had to, um, just to get me lined up. Um, I, based on what you said, Ken, I think it would that the council would be very interested in the costs of the various options, whether it's used as a price metric or not. So, for example, you know, if you ask, if you made me take a test on it. I wouldn't have thought about button rock enlargement, but it's a really good idea because it's good clean water, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, but that doesn't mean it has to be our cash in lieu metric, right? It's just something that's available to Longmont. And um, I don't know, I hope the staff would be collaborating on what of all of our options are when we do the, density planning for um, the next comp plan, right? I hope so, but yeah, yeah. I'd, want this, I'd want the council to know too. Yeah, we absolutely need to be part of that because we need to understand what it means for our water supply. Mm -hmm. if, if we're gonna plan it, um, you know, we have always held the position that the community can, should be able to plan but at once, and we have a responsibility as a water department to, to fit that plan un, unless we can't. And then we have an obligation to tell the planning department we can't. So you're absolutely, ab you're absolutely right. Good point. That we and we will be involved in that planning process to make sure um, we don't overstep our, <laughs> our future ability to deliver. Yeah. 
Okay, great. I'm all caught up and thank you. Cool, thank you. Are there any other questions? I've, I've got a few, but does anybody else want to go? Um, I guess I'll ask mine. Number one, Ken, if I remember the, the city attorney when his, his presentation to us, I thought one of the, the things that he told us is we could not charge twice for the same service. And I, I guess what I'm wondering is we have this windy gap surcharge fee that's applied to new development. H how can we charge that and then turn around? And I know, you know, windy gap water plus the firming project may just be a matrix or a, a proxy, so to speak, in terms of the price. But are, aren't, doesn't that surcharge fee apply towards acquisition of raw water. I mean, when we weren't including the raw water component of Windy Gap, we're just including the firming project that made maybe a little more sense to me, but um, have you talked to the city attorney's office about that? Yes, that that really get, gets to where, you know, the caution about using Windy Gap as a metrics rather than um, portraying it as where the money's actually gonna go, because you're absolutely right. We have, um, have already paid for the pumping, the diversion and pumping project. Um, so the money obviously won't be going there. And the Windy Gap surcharge, um, that surcharge is directly going to pay for the Windy Gap firming project. All the funding from that, um, I mean, you can kind of say, well, it all goes into the water fund, <laughs> but but it's it's pretty well, uh, you know, that funding is is specifically directed to pay off the bonds for the and and the surcharge is scheduled to end on the same year that the last bond uh, payment is made. So it's a you know a, sh a short term surcharge to 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 pay for that. Um, and that's why we believe it's, it is reasonable to use a metrics as long as the windy gap is a metrics, as long as we're clear, that, that is not where the money is going. It's going, it's going, it's going to pay for, um, future projects. But, but if, if you have a surcharge and it's going towards whether it's windy gap or, or something else, isn't that partially a payment for their, is that not considered part of their payment for raw water to the city? Is that, that's considered separate? I mean, I, I'm just stuck on this. You know, there's a surcharge coming in for the new development. They're paying for part of, let's say the Windy Gap Firming Project. It's adding yield to the city's water system. So, and then we're having a metric or a proxy with Windy Gap that includes water plus storage. Aren't they paying you know, at least a component of that twice? Um, they, they are not because irrespective, the cash in lieu is to bring everybody up to three acre feet per acre um, on, on the raw water dedication fee. The, the surcharge um, is applied equally whether you have, if you have no water and you pay 100% cash in lieu, or you have three acre feet per acre, it, that doesn't matter. That brings everybody to the, to the level okay. playing field of three acre feet per acre. And then everybody who takes out a tap pays for the surcharge. So the surcharge um, basically is on top of uh, the three acre feet. You're not you're not trying to use that to pay any of the of the raw water requirement policy. So it is specifically um, to pay for directly water, you know, water coming um, to the tap, which really is is uh, uh, you know a, 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 that fee pays for that next incremental, uh, the incremental water delivered to that um, tap. Okay. Well, that helps that everybody's kind of treated the same, whether they have the three acre foot per acre in wet water or they got a big cash and loo, that, that helps me. Um, a couple other, I guess, things that 
strike me as during this conversation. Number one on PRPA, I know we're talking about, well, instead of maybe 15 years, you try to push it to a 25 year on the opt out, you extend the term of the lease from 75 to 100 years. The, the, the bottom line to me is it's not a permanent water supply. So to sit there and, and well, <laughs> If it goes from 15 to 25 on the opt out and 75 to 100, let's call it a permanent water supply. In my mind, that's not a permanent water supply. It, at some point, and the anecdote I'd use is look at the town of Craig. Craig has a power plant and they have a coal mine. And if you would ask them 10 or 20 years ago, I'm sure they thought that those two were going to be around in perpetuity. They're both going away. They just, there was an article about it I read in the paper today. You know, by 2030, those, the um, power plant and I believe the coal mine are both going to be shut down. So I, I just feel like we're, we're kind of <laughs> deceiving ourselves if we sit there and, and kind of paper around the fact that it's not a permanent water supply. And if we can make that decision, it'll help us with our planning. Because if we wait 25 years to start developing those water supplies, good luck. Um, it's going to be a heck of a lot more difficult at that point than knowing that, hey, we need to be ready that in 25 years, those supplies could be gone and we better have our ducks in a row before that occurs. So that, that's my first point. The, the second point is, is in the context of these costs of these projects, you know, you brought up Button Rock and, and you know, I think Union Reservoir enlargement plays into this. I think we need to understand what does or does not have major federal permit <laughs> implications. Um, I just look at Windy Gap Firming was the off-channel reservoir. In my mind, it, it, it's simple as a, probably not the right term to use, but you know, it didn't, it wasn't on channel and that took over 20 years to get permitted. And during that 20 year period, the cost of that project went up, you know, by an order of magnitude. So I think we need to be really careful about trying to hitch the wagon to costs that are tied to a project that takes a federal permit um, and, you know, whether or not that's viable at a minimum, it's going to take, you know, by decades to do and things only get more difficult as things go into the future. At least that's what the track record has been. So I think we need to be real careful about that, that component of it. On Union, Reservo Union um, Reservoir pump back, the one, one thing that would be interesting to me is how much yield could we generate without having to do the enlargement of the reservoir? And what's the cost of that? Because those would be projects that I think we could do without having to get into this federal permitting and the, the cost and the, the risk associated with it. Um, so that just a couple of comments um, in terms of how we look at this going forward on those proxies or the, the, you know, trying to compare cost estimates and how we set cash and loo. Um, so anyway, just a couple of points based on the previous um, discussion we had. I mean, the, I guess the way I look at this is if we set it now based on Windy Gap as a, a proxy with the thought that, you know, and, and Tom, to your point, we're gonna have updated costs for the pump back project coming in, in 2022, number one. Number two, and I know I brought this up previously, I think there's, there's risks and we may wanna adjust the safety factor on supplies. I know in the write-up um, that Ken did, they, they talk about, you know, um, they're gonna be talking to Northern, we're gonna be looking at modeling. How does the yield of the Windy Gap firm, Firming Project change in the future? Um, and that may need to be built into those, those costs as we go into the future too. So in my mind, we're kind of setting it as a proxy today with, if we agree with it, there's going to be other information that comes as we move into the future and we can reevaluate that as that information comes. So anyway, I'm, I guess personally, I'm okay with using um, Windy Gap, both in terms of the water and the project, um, firming project is the proxy with knowing that there's going to be additional bites of the apple as we find out additional information in the future. Um, but I would like this um, PRPA, or not PRPA, but um, I'm sorry, public service. I would like that kind of coupled with this discussion, maybe with the council, just so everybody understands um, that, you know, how much water do we need to develop and how does that relate to the projects that we're going to be looking at and the costs as we move into the future. So I'm um, sorry to take so much time, but just a, a few things as we go through this that are sticking out to me. So I don't know, I'll open it up. Anybody else have any, want to respond to that, Ken or Wes, or if there's any other questions? 
Um, just just one real quick response. Um, you you know I, I I think all the points you're making are are really so excellent that we actually were not planning on taking directly to council the 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 price increase. I'll, I'll get the recommendation on the cash and loop price. We actually have scheduled to go to the February study session of council um, to, to bring this information to them um, because I mean, your points are so well taken. We felt this is the kind of stuff that it, it take a little bit of, you know, uh, it take a study session to, to get this information to council because it's a big thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a big area. And so um, we'll do that study session and then follow up with an actual um, resolution for the cash and a change. And that that will be a great time to get more input, you know, back from council. Um, and all that will happen at the end of February, hopefully, <laughs> we can get it scheduled right, that then in March, um, council may ask us to, to tweak it a little bit more at the March uh, quarterly uh, setting. So I think there's real good opportunity to take all of that information continue to update our numbers and continue to, to do that. So that's, that's a really good point, John. Okay, Scott? Yeah, I was just gonna piggyback on um, the conversation with a question to Ken, because I, I know we've talked about it, but is there a projected time by which we'll have union pump back costs in 2022? And, and the reason I'm asking is because this seems like a, a push to put in place a slightly elevated cost in lieu price first quarter of 2022 and i'm not sure it's the best metric at the end of the day and depending on when additional information is available it's a policy question as to when to raise it but if the information is available relatively soon um it, it seems like that would be more helpful or a better basis or at least a a portion of information which we could make a better recommendation upon yeah, I uh, I don't know. Jason Jason has been talking to um, Darren Alt about getting um, some of that information to us. I don't know, Jason. Do you have a uh, any kind of a commitment yet from <laughs> from uh, th those folks about when they might have that information to us? Actually, I was working with uh, Dewberry uh, to provide updates on that, and I'm still working with them to get us a proposal. Um, they do have some of that background information. They thought it wouldn't take very long, but uh, you know that kind of like everybody else, they've been really busy at the moment and I've not yet received the proposal, but uh, it's due here in the next week or two. The proposal. Correct. To, to, to give us the updated costs on some of those projects. Yeah, probably wouldn't be reasonable to think we'd have it for the March, water, March uh, quarterly report, but we could try to push them a little bit to have it for the June, um, you know, which, which may, well, if that's the case, it may make sense to set the fee now, the recommendation now and plan on updating that in, at, at the June quarterly uh, review. And I'm, I'm not opposed to the, to the proposal, Ken. I just wanted to understand the timing element to that. Um, I think there's another component to the proposal, which is the possibility of stepping it so that it's not a, you know, three-time multiplier, uh, you know, immediately. And I, I, again, I think that it's likely that we'll have better information upon which to make a better recommendation in the calendar year. So to the extent that there's a step, you know, process that probably makes more sense to people that have been trying to come in and, and bring a proposal to you. <laughs> And all of a sudden, they've got a, a bigger number immediately. Um, but I, I don't have a, a proposal of that either, other than it seems like it's about a multiplier of three. So if you went up 50 per, or 100% and then another, you know, you go halfway and then another halfway over a period of time, that probably makes more sense to me. Okay. Tom? Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I agree with. Scott, in the sense that it seems like it's something that would have to be phased in and that that gives us a little bit of additional time, perhaps, to get additional information. So, for example, I mean, I would suggest something like 
picking a year or, or a, a number of years. So whether if you said, well, we're, we're going to phase it in in a year or two years time, well, then now that's you take the additional increment increase and you divide it by either four or eight and add that to each quarter. And, and then that, that enables you to then have with some caveat in there of, you know, pending additional information or something that could kind of disrupt that, 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 what, that, uh, that, that, I don't know, process or math or whatever, I guess. Right. So, um, so I, it just kind of enables us to have a little bit more time, maybe to get some additional information perhaps. So if we kind of agreed on some kind of phase in period and then it's just a little, not nearly the large steps or the large kind of increase that, that might surprise some, I suppose. I don't know. Roger. Uh, I guess I'll take a contrarian view. I, I don't think the increase, it's a significant increase, but I think considering where we are now, I've always felt we're so low compared to the others that we were underpricing it. And I'm very comfortable with, with taking it to this level at the present time. I'm just giving you my opinion. I, uh, I still think we're just considerably lower than the rest of the communities. And I think that kind of gives us a little bit of a disadvantage when we're, uh, you know, going about any type of proposals. I, I just think it's out of the ballpark. And I'm, I guess I'm saying, I think these are the best numbers we have right now. And I'd be comfortable with proceeding with these numbers and the price they came out with. So I'm just, I'm just voicing my opinion. That's what mayor looks at it, Roger. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I'm, un, I'm not uncomfortable with that number because I think we've just been too far out of the ballpark. And it's based on good information. So that's just how I feel about it. Any other comments, Scott? I, I won't um, take issue with Roger's opinion because I, I recognize that, that that's an appealing way to, to view it. I, I would just echo Ken's thoughts, which is there's absolutely, there's very little reason to look at communities surrounding us and what they do and apply that to what we do. It really ought to be a technical an objective analysis of what it costs for Longmont to provide water, not what Fort Collins does, not what Firestone does. And, and the fact that it's a, differenti a differentiable rate, frankly, is, is um, a credit to the way that we planned historically. You now, the people that are out there charging a hell of a lot more are people that didn't think about having a water system until five years ago and now are struggling to catch up. And their real cost to add an additional acre foot of water is exponentially higher than ours. So I, that's, that's just, you know, I, Roger, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with the way you look at it. I'm just saying that that's, I, I, would, I would hope that there's no uh, comments on the record from anybody saying we need to do this because Firestone is, right? I mean, because it's just, it's just not the right basis legally upon which to, to make a policy decision, in my opinion. But yeah, we can go, we can go full freight. I'm fine. <laughs> I, just, I, I just think that, that it is a, a fairly big sticker shock. And you know, there are probably are people that have been in the queue waiting that will be surprised, but oh well, I, that, that's council's decision, not mine. Tom, you had your hand up and then Roger, you can go after Tom. Well, why don't, Roger, go ahead and maybe respond. No, I, and I, I'm not trying to put a lot on comparison to other communities, but I think Ken did and his staff did a good job of trying to put solid numbers together. And that's what we're basing this on. And I'm, I'm not leaning towards how we are. I'm, you know, I'm just making that as a, a comment, but I'm, I'm comfortable with the, the numbers that Ken put together and I, I think they're solid and uh, I don't think there's any problem submitting them. And uh, yeah, numbers may change down the road, but I would prefer to, to go with the numbers that we believe are correct now and we wanna do some adjustment down the road, fine. Sure, and maybe pick up there and then Todd. Um, so yeah, I mean, a couple of things. My um, my instinct is still that we we still don't necessarily have a really good understanding of of that next project, 
right? It was, I feel like we're still kind of using proxy data from past projects to influence or to inform the future. And, and so I, I'd, I'd still really like to see what, what we think the next project for us looks like, right? Um, I will kind of pick up with what Scott said as well, that we're very much the beneficiaries of these wonderful decisions that were made in the past, right? And, and I think the thing that has, to the extent that I've been, I don't know, um, disappointed is too strong a word, but to the extent that I've been a little disheartened by the, by the conversation is that I wonder what would happen if we kind of shift the, the thought process to saying, okay, well, we have these relatively lower costs relative to these other communities, right? And is there a way to kind of use that, that benefit, right, that our kind of predecessors have kind of provided to us to our advantage as a community, right? So these low, relatively lower water costs, at least into the future, right? Um, at least as previously calculated, right? Could, could we somehow use that as a springboard to kind of create some kind of tangible benefit for the community? And I, I don't know that we've, we've really kind of like had that discussion because we're a little bit kind of bogged down in, in having the discussion about, well, what should the cost of water be? And I just, I kind of wonder whether whether something more could have come out of that. And so that's something that I might kind of think about a little bit more into the future, whether or not those, or, or more so ask city council, right? What, what some of their thoughts might be about kind of how to use those relatively low water costs relative to all of our surrounding communities to uh, enable, like I said, tangible benefits, right? For the community. So, so okay, thanks. Tom. Marcia, Marcia, you can go. My space bar isn't working, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't want to uh, interject a full policy viewpoint into this because, you know, that's for the council to do next month a little bit. But um, I have a hard time thinking about this in terms, not in terms of how much is it going to provide now, but how much is it going to cost the city to provide in the future? And we have a very uncertain future. Um, so I guess if we're going to look at, you know, what advantage a low price brings, uh, maybe, you know, I missed it when I was on my call, but what's, what's the, um, what's the advantage that we would expect to have by having low costs, because it is not that we're having a hard time attracting people who want to develop our land. Yeah, so maybe I'll respond. I, I think uh, two, two things. First of all, I mean, I, I, I do feel like, you know, there, there is a potentially a tangible benefit with respect to affordable housing. I know that water is only a small component of that. So uh, of course, that may not be nearly the kind of bang for the buck, if you will, that that you would uh, that you would really be able to point to and see, say, see what look what we did. Um, however, I do think that if we reframed the discussion, that planning for the future is a tangible benefit, right? That like that that some kind of you know, like I said, like I've been kind of saying uh, a bit, you know, that some kind of rainy day fund, right? That, that we are better prepared for, for a future, right? That, that, is, that is drier and more uncertain potentially, right? And, and um, I feel like that, even that discussion, if that's where it went, that's, that's fine with me, but, but, um, but kind of calling it a little bit more what it is, which is kind of contingency planning, et cetera. I'm just, I'm just not quite sure that I see what our real costs are yet, Right, what what our kind of what what the real costs look like, even within a pseudo certain future, that then we can put a ten percent or twenty percent buffer on top of that. I can justify those things at least within my own mind. Right now, I feel like um, I'm still kind of using past data as kind of prologue to the to the future in a way, 
that maybe isn't isn't quite what I'm understanding to be kind of the next in incremental cost, perhaps, right? Yeah, there was just a thing uh, on the radio this morning that that uh, talked about how little the past is predicting the future right now in, in terms of, of weather. And so, yeah, I'm not sure that we should be using backward looking met metrics at this point. And um, we should have a big uncertainty factor. But Go ahead. Well, and one note there, I, I think I mentioned earlier, that's part of what, you know, with the Windy Gap project, for example, I think the modeling is gonna be updated and we're gonna try to take that into account as we move forward. Um, at least in the context of Windy Gap, and we'll probably have to do the same with, you know, the unit reservoir pump back. We're just going to have to evolve as this thing kind of moves down the road. Um, and in my mind, we, like you say, we just don't have the data at this point. But in my mind, we're, we're setting a point today, what we think may be a kind of quote unquote reasonable cost while we're getting additional information on Union Reservoir, reservoir pump back or the other projects that we are actually um, pursuing and we can update those costs as we get that information. So uh, it, in my mind, I think we're, we're setting up hopefully the right format that as we get in additional information, whether it's, you know, the impacts of climate change, whether it's, you know, construction costs on Union Reservoir, we can, you know, update that um, cash and loop price accordingly. Um, so anyway, so Ken, in, in terms of what you need today, you're, you're saying you're going to have kind of a policy discussion or you're going to bring this concept. And I guess maybe that's a question for today of, you know, is the water board okay with bringing this concept to the council next month? And then you'll come back to us with a resolution at that point for further consideration. Is that where you're headed here? Yeah, well, what, what we would, I guess, ideally like is, is exactly what you're describing, um, recommending that we um, use a policy of a full provision of a full acre foot of water, wet water from entire project basis. And if that is the case, then at the very least, we should increase the cash and loo to 48.5 as part of this review process, knowing that we'll have quarterly reviews, March, June, September, and December. You know, we can, we'll certainly continue this discussion um, at each quarterly review. We'll um, be able to fine tune this, but that if, if, if it is this policy, you know, since we, since we adjust it every quarter, I don't see a real big problem in going ahead and going to 48.5 now. And then it might go up or down as we continue to refine it, but um, we'll certainly be closer kind of the, to the benchmark of a project basis evaluation if we, if we do it now. So it's really a two-step, approve that policy and then set the cash and loo at this, as of this setting at 48.5. Okay, um, any comments on that um, of going there? It, and I guess the other point that was brought up is this phasing. Seems to me that's maybe back to the council discussion of, you know, um, do they wanna look at that in a phasing plan, but I guess I'm uh, I'm comfortable with going to the 48.5 now. Um, I know you know we need more information as we move in the future, and there may be some kind of some other information coming. But I think to just using it as a proxy to make sure we're in the ballpark of a full project. I mean, to date we've been looking at what's the incremental cost with when you get firming. If we're going to change that mindset to a full um, project, water rights plus the you know firming project, I think that's a, a good proxy for now to go ahead and set it while we're waiting on this additional information um, to revisit that um, as we move forward. So that's that's where I'm at. I'll let the rest of the board kind of weigh in if if you know, we're okay bringing that to council next month. 
I got a thumbs up from Scott Rogers, a thumbs up and Tom is as well. So Ken, it looks like you have your marching orders on that and then you'll bring it back um, after the work session with council. And then we'll, we'll look at um, putting a resolution in place or something more definitive at that point. Is that where we're headed? Yeah, we'll, we'll look at, we'll re-review this again at the March quarterly review. Okay, sounds good. Um, with that, I think we're on to the, the next item. So we're, we're on to nine and nine A is a monthly legislative report, Ken. Yes, um, be fairly brief this month. Um, the legislation, uh, legislature convened on January 12th and um, we'll uh, adjourn on May 11th. Um, as you know, every member gets to introduce two, two bills at the start of the session. So um, the initial kind of rush of uh, bills came in. Um, there actually aren't a lot of water bills right now um, sitting out there. There's only been three water bills uh, and one joint resolution. The three water bills were the first one, they're all in the, introduced in the Senate. The first one was the groundwater compact fund. Um, so that doesn't affect Longmont. That's uh, a fund to help um, meet the interstate compacts on the South Platte and the Republican rivers. Um, you know, important legislation, but doesn't directly impact Longmont. Um, the second is a bill to further try to crack down on um, water speculation, um, Senate Bill 22-029. Um, ag again, that probably doesn't directly impact Longmont. We weren't at this point, ready yet to take a, a position on it, but uh, they try every legislature to, to try to crack down a little bit more on water speculation. That's that's pretty tough to do though. Um, then finally, um, Senate Bill 30 was to expand the Water Resources Review Committee to include a specific seat for um, Colorado agriculture. I'm fine with that, but uh, Again, it, it, it doesn't directly impact Longmont. So we aren't, aren't uh, asking for any um, uh, recommendations. Um, it, it, none of these bills go forward uh, right away at the start of the legislature. So we'll come back in February with um, more information on all of, the, all, all of the water bills at that point. Probably of more interest is the wildfire bills. Actually, even though there's three water bills or five wildfire bills already introduced and wildfire, both because of the East Troublesome and the um, Cameron Peak fires and then the, the, the recent fires in Superior and Louisville is really a, kind of more of a focus of the legislature this year. Um, and probably the, the one bill that's of most uh, importance to us right now is House Bill 221011, which is uh, uh, wildfire mitigation incentives for local government. So the state is looking to set up um, additional funding for wildfire mitigation. I can tell you Longmont has taken wildfire um, planning and forest stewardship very serious for many years. In fact, we came up with uh, originally over 20 years, about 20 years ago, we developed the Button Rock Preserve Forest Health, uh, Forest Stewardship Plan to do forest health up in that area. And we've been working uh, doing that for now 20 years. So we've got a really good start, uh, well ahead of other people. We were one of the first in the area to really uh, do a, a larger effort on that. Um, but uh, additional money, and multi-jurisdictional activities are important. Um, those are going on. So um, it looks like there's gonna be a little bit of um, money and effort, and then there's gonna be a lot of focus on that in the next couple of years. Um, certainly pr protecting our watershed is extremely important to us. 
And as those bills start fleshing out, again, we'll bring, we'll even bring some of those back to you at the February. We haven't had a chance to really go through and look at those wildfire bills um, too in depth yet, but we will do that and, and bring those back in February. So don't have any action today, but just a quick summary of the legislation where it's going. And it's, as every year this time of year, it's starting off. <laughs> So that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Any questions for Ken on, on just the general topics? Um, sounds like we'll get into it a lot more detail in future months. Not hearing any comments. Um, all right. With that, we'll move on to 9B, which is Water Resources Engineering Projects Update. Jason. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to give... Uh, you guys a quick update on a couple of big projects. Um, so the South St. Vrain pipeline rehab project, um, we have finished lining the first half of the pipeline. That's gonna get us uh, basically from the diversion structure in the creek, um, just east of the fire station in Lyons. So that'll get us through the town of Lyons. Um, so that's been completely lined. We're currently in the process of um, tidying up the project, cleaning stuff up um, and demobilizing uh, all the uh, heavy equipment um, so that our new contractor, who we're about to award the pump station project to, can mobilize into that same spot. And so um, uh, I'm currently in the process uh, of, of awarding the contract for the construction services for the St. Vrain, the South St. Vrain Pipeline pump station project, which is a separate project, but again ties into the South St. Vrain Pipeline, which uh, basically puts an interconnect between the South and the North Pipeline. Um, and so we're expecting construction to probably kick off here in the next two months based on uh, the time it takes to award and to route the contract and everything um, uh, and, and actually get that executed. So I, I anticipate probably the end of February, if we're early, um, to be doing the um, uh, pre-construction meeting with the new contractor. Um, so anyway, that's pretty exciting. We came in under budget, well under our engineer's estimate. Uh, and so that's, um, we're excited about that. Um, a quick announcement that uh, uh, engineering uh, services, um, engineering administrator, Larry Wayno is retiring at the end of the month. And so I'll be taking over a couple of his projects, uh, notably uh, WTR 112, which is the North St. Brain Pipeline Replacement Project. Uh, that's a CIP project that's been going on for some time. And so I'll be taking over that. Um, currently we are, um, at 60% design for phase, uh, phase nine, which is 1600, it's about 1600 linear feet of uh, uh, the pipeline that's uh, within highway 66, just east of the town of Lyons. Um, so anyway, uh, I'll be taking that over at the end of this month and uh, we'll be taking those 60% design plans and moving them to 90. Um, and then after that, the plan is to uh, roll that in uh, uh, to construction, uh, which we'll do later this summer. Um, so, uh, having said that, those are some of the big fish that I got going on. There's a bunch of little stuff going, but that's, that's really the, the big major projects that we have going on. Um, any questions on those? Any questions for Jason? No, thank you for the update, Jason. Appreciate it. Was there anything yeah, no, else or was that the, that was all of them? That's really it. Um, you know, I could give you a quick update on Button Rock Outlet. You know, we're working on a plan to uh, do some permanent repairs on that, replace the bronze seat. Uh, the bronze seat that's currently in there is the same seat that was originally installed, and it's not, it wasn't installed to be serviceable. So we're looking at a plan to, uh, to try to remove that and to put in a serviceable bronze seat for, for the future. Um, other than that, I don't have too many details. We're still looking at multiple options. It's, 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 it, that one is a pretty complicated uh, project. Uh, um, it's it's, it's, it's uh, looking at it on paper, it looks easy, but actually doing it, getting it in there um, without having to tear apart the gate and do major construction, that's the hard part. How, how can we piece this back in? Uh, the, uh, the demolition part is the easy part. It's reassembling that's the hard. And to do that in under two weeks, that's that's also the challenge. So anyway, we're working on that. And um, in future water board meetings, I'll hopefully have a plan that uh, I can I can show you. Uh, but right now it's, yeah, it's working out the details. Okay, great. Thank you for the update. No problem, thank any you. Any questions for Jason? Not seeing any, keep moving. Um, next item is a water conservation update. Francie, are you out there? 
Yes, and hopefully I didn't switch my headphones to mute this time. Um, so uh, two updates. Uh, one, I believe I, I let the uh, water board know uh, last year that um, the water conservation budget was supporting the sugar mill and steam um, revitalization update and specifically to support uh, that there is a focus on storm drainage and sustainable infrastructure and really looking into um, how water conservation um, and low impact development can be a key part of that. Um, other parts of that project focus on transportation, land use, and urban design. Uh, that effort is underway. The project team is um, currently working um, with property owners, area developers, there is a Engage Longmont webpage where there's a survey that residents can fill out. Um, there was also a, an update um, recently to uh, city council uh, that that can be shared. Um, it's that I can I can send a Tammy to share out to the water board along with that Engage Longmont link. Um, there is some upcoming um, uh, engagement opportunities. So the project manager, uh, one of the project managers recently asked if there are any specific converse, uh, questions about water conservation um, or other topics around water that could be asked about kind of in this um, development area. So I also wanted to um, put that out to the water board in case you all had uh, any questions along um, the, the, I don't, I forgot to bring, grab a map, but the steam, I, I can quickly and share it if folks are not familiar with the steam and sugar mill development area, but wanted to, to ask if there are any questions about this, um, this upcoming um, sub area planning process that why the project managers are engaging the public, the water board may want to add or include in kind of that discussion. Um, my understanding is that they're really trying to take this as an opportunity in the sub area planning to really explore different sustainability concepts and opportunities. I don't know about the rest of the board. It would help me to see a map. I'm not up to speed on exactly what what I was proposed there, Nancy? No problem. Let me find one quickly. And um, here, I believe this is from So I I I am only um, I I would if there are any detailed questions I would probably I I would direct um, water board members to go watch the city council presentation, um, but I just wanted to pull this up as this is the area here and highlighted in pink, that is where they are doing the sub area plan. Um, so this is Main Street here and that's third. Uh, so at the focus is a lot along kind of understanding um, opportunities and challenges and creating the infrastructure in this area. And uh, I wanted to, the, why I have this pulled up, here's actually also the engaged Longmont um, overview that goes into more depth. And then again, also has that highlighted uh, area with the survey. So when creating this um, this plan for currently, they are looking for, if we're developing this area, are there opportunities that we can be uh, more ambitious in how we develop around pursuing water conservation, stormwater drainage, low impact development? Um, so that, that's where there could be opportunities when engaging the public that if there's a specific question that the water board may be interested in hearing from the public. Um, I, I just wanted to kind of open that up to, to the group um, to see if there are anything, but I, I know this is just kind of a, a quick 
a quick update and overview. And there could be an opportunity if after watching the video or kind of looking through in this in more depth that you could also reach out to me over email and I can pass that along to the project managers as well. Okay, thank you, Francie. I, I don't see Ken, maybe um, Wes or Nelson. I assume all the raw water um, obligations are satisfied for that area. So it's just purely redevelopment. So whatever comes on, there will be a new kind of water demand without additional water supplies coming into the city. Is that correct? Um, I don't know. I'd have to look at each. It's a pretty big parcel. I, I, I'm not as sure if 100% of that area within the boundaries of that area have been fully annexed. I'm fairly certain if they if it all if they've been annexed, they've not been platted, and that's where the um, okay. proverbial rubber will hit the road on satisfying deficits. So that'll be part of this conversation. Okay. Marcia, did you maybe have some insight there? Yes, um, at the eastern end. Um, two of the three parcels that, that uh, um, are the sugar mill area are in fact outside the Longmont city limits and would need, would require an annexation. So, um, and, and I do not believe that the, the third has been platted either. Um, all three of them are under contract by develop, developers, but two of them are not inside Longmont yet. So that probably tells you some of it. Thank you. Francie, did you have some? Yeah, I, I'm not as familiar with that component of it, but this um, partnership to for water resources to provide funding to planning for the development of this sub area plan came out of uh, a joint departmental effort um, focused on growing water smart, trying to bet, continue to integrate the water use and land use nexus, which I think I've mentioned to the board before. So we're really trying to use this as an opportunity of how can, it, are there ways we can be really innovative of uh, developing land in a way that minimizes water usage um, to really kind of promote uh, how, like if there's other redevelopment areas, can we use this point to this this property and say here are actually very innovative ways you can really reduce your water usage uh, so it, it's also serving we're hoping to serve in kind of a demonstration site as like that trying to embody that growing water smart mentality that's great well thanks for the update any and other I, questions or comments then, Todd, I, 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 I did want to respond real quickly to um you, more specifically, your question on some of the deficits. Um, there is a, a large portion of that property on the east side that is the former sugar mill property. And, and you may recall um, in the 1970s when the sugar company, Great Western Sugar Company, was divesting itself and selling out, they sold the water rights off of that. So there's a good little chunk of property out there when it acts, annexes will have uh, no historical water right on it. So it'll owe the full three acre feet per acre deficit. So yeah, the cash and loof setting is gonna be interesting for that project. Great, okay, thank you, Francie. I appreciate your, your update, that's a neat project. Did you have something else? Yes, I have one other, ho uh, hopefully also a neat project. Um, starting this past fall, we started to get the data coming in from our um, automated meter readers for our new meters with water. Um, so the over, I am working with two other staff members and I've been looking through the continuous water usage data. And this year we're hoping to develop a you looking at that continuous water usage, which we now are getting multiple reads per day instead of one read a month to identify leaks. Um, so we haven't fully established the program um, so far, but and most things that I'm finding are, I would say maybe one gallon per, per, uh, one gallon per hour, very minor. Um, but during our testing process, we came across a, a 
a leak that looked like it was 90 to 120 gallons of water per hour. And that it sounded like it actually was from a leaking toilet. Um, so hopefully as we continue to do this testing process, we'll continue to identify uh, and figure out a process of notifying residents when they have leaks that are, I would say above that 50 gallons of water usage um, per hour so that we can notify them within a couple of days instead of a, a month later when they receive a really high water bill. So we're just starting this process. It'll probably be in, it, later in the second half of the year uh, until we've, uh, we have a uh, kind of a more robust program, but just wanted to let the water board know that that's a, a project that we're working on developing this year and have uh, gotten started. And then my last update is that we have released the water efficiency specialist position, and that is open until February 1st. Great, thank you, Francie. Any questions, comments on the board? I don't see any, thank you very much. So now we're on to 9D, which is the monthly water supply update, Wes. Yeah, in, in light of the time, I'll, I'll go really quick on this. Um, we've included in the packet, as we always do, four to five different pertinent pieces of information on the current water supply. Uh, the first one, uh, Tammy, if you could go to page 55 of our packet, we always try to include the end of month reservoir storage information. Nelson had mentioned we had around 66, 67% at the start of the month. So we'll, by virtue of this being a later meeting, we'll have a, a new read coming out next week. But I can tell you that's very close in alignment to where we the five-year average is. And so last year, you may recall Button Rock was full at this time, but we had Union down. This year, Button Rock's down and, and Union's only slightly down. So, but near similar numbers. So we feel like we're in a pretty similar and, and decent spot. As we move through the packet on the, on the next section there, we always include the Colorado Water Supply Outlook Report. And that report is put out at the, at the uh, beginning of the each month. Again, since we're 24 days into this month, that, that information is a little bit dated, but especially wanted to kind of share with folks, if, uh, if we go to the next page, kind of the Colorado statewide water supply condition. And wanted to basically say that as of right now, and as it was shown in January 1st, that we're, I'm just gonna say near average. Um, as we continue to kind of move through the packet, I'm gonna go ahead and jump uh, to page 66. That's where we have the South Platte River Basin snowpack summary. And in that graph, you'll see where you have a pretty good stagger where we're now above average 127%. That was of January 10th. This month, or I'm sorry, today, we were closer to 100 and somewhere around 120, 117%, something like that. And that was similar for the next page on the upper Colorado River Basin. And so what you can find when looking at these graphs is you see where single storm events definitely impact the uh, snowpack. And so I think we're forecasted for up to about a half a foot in, in the Rocky Mountain National Park overnight and tomorrow. And so we're gonna continue to see those bumps. But uh, my point is in the next two months, the months of February and March, we usually see about a third of our snow water equivalent coming in. So we're gonna be paying close attention uh, from this point forward, but at least we have a good starting point now that we're above average. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to just point on was on page 69, the US drought monitor. I'm gonna start including that um, just to kind of give a general sense of overall the way we're the status. And you'll see that right now, the state of Colorado is in, in the classification between abnormally dry and extreme drought. Uh, Boulder County itself is kind of in the moderate to severe drought. And these, these um, outlook reports come out um, a couple times a week, I believe. It may actually even be just once a week. And so they'll change a little bit, but uh, we're not in an exceptional drought and we don't have anywhere that doesn't have any drought. But so we're kind of, kind of where we expect it to be, but certainly we'll be uh, 
tracking very closely in the uh, months to come, but we think we're in a reasonably good position uh, as we stand right now. That's all I have, unless there's some questions. Are there any questions for Wes on the water supply update? I'm not saying any. Thank you, Wes. Okay. So we're on to item 10, which is um, review of project listings and items tentatively scheduled for future board me meetings. Is there anything um, on that item in the packet or just anything else that the, the board wants to, to bring up today? You know, I, I, I will mention one thing um, on Jason's report. I don't know if you guys have seen in the papers, but um, Northwell Water District had an issue with um, getting a permits and a pipeline through Fort Collins and they've actually issued a moratorium on taps for the town of Severance. The, the only comment I bring up there is I just think that anybody, any entity that has a water supply system that goes through another jurisdiction, <laughs> the more you can do to, you know, kind of stay ahead of um, making sure your facilities are in good shape and um, you know, operating well. I mean, it obviously provides flexibility, but also just surety for the, the city. And I know it, it's tough for North Weld and some of the folks that are um, the cities that are under their system. So just kind of highlight maybe Jason's work and the, the city's work in that regard. So Scott, you had a comment? Yeah, just to make it um, crystal clear, North, North Weld didn't uh, just put a moratorium on the town of Severance taps. It put a moratorium on all taps and Severance is getting all the press because they then put a moratorium on their building permits and they have no money coming in the door based upon no building permits. So others up there are similarly situated. They're just more visibly, more visibly public than others because they've got a lot more on the uh, planning docket than the others do. Thanks for that clarification. You're right. I just highlight the, you know, importance of making sure the infrastructure that Longmont has is in good working condition. And, you know, obviously with the flood, there was a lot of work that came out of that. And just want to commend Jason and staying on top of it and making sure it's it's working as it should. So did you have another comment, Scott? Yeah, I was just gonna say uh, the other the other element up there that's you know, just for um, context, it's not really so much the the status of how their existing infrastructure is being kept. It's the fact that they need to add additional infrastructure. And as Todd mentioned, being a multi-jurisdictional governmental entity, having to deal with city of Fort Collins, Larimer County, Weld County, um, they can't build fast enough under the permitting situation to uh, deal with the growth that's occurring up in Tinmouth and Windsor and Severance and all that. So fortunately we don't have the same, <laughs> the same variables, but um, I'm always grateful for living in Longmont as a water consumer, believe me. Right. You're right. Different conditions, but in my mind, it kind of highlights, you know, <laughs> make sure you take care of what you got because absolutely <clears throat> it can be hard to replace down the road. So thank you, Scott. Hey, Chad. Um, anyway, do anybody else have any other comments? Uh, I'm not seeing any, so we'll we'll keep moving hey, on. Um, item 11 is informational items in water hey, board correspondence. Okay? Hey, Todd. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Nelson, did you? Yeah, Nelson had an item and then yeah. I have one. So I just want to comment with. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, go ahead. When Scott uh, brought up North Weld. So in your in that uh, uh, cash and do comparison table that we have, uh, North Weld is in there. And I actually did identify before this whole news broke out with severance. It's identified in there that they had a moratorium. I put a date in there. I think I believe I have a date in there too. So just wanted to let you guys know that we are. I did put that in there in that sheet already. Okay, thank you, Nelson. Wes, did you have some? Yeah, I just wanted to, one last thing on that. We always include on the water board project status report, water board terms. And uh, this year, uh, Todd's term is up. Um, wanted to let, remind water board back in December, city council um, met, I think it was on the 14th. And we can send you a link to that. Um, at that meeting, uh, Councilman, um, uh, help me out, Ken, um, Waters, Councilman Waters, made a recommendation for boards in the future, so starting this mid-year, to have boards more engaged in the uh, applicant selection process. 
So generally, um, and, and no final details have been made. We're just beginning this with the uh, some of the direction of the city uh, clerk's office. But what we're hearing is that what might be coming forward is where each board would have a maybe a two board member along with possibly a staff member um, doing interviews. So it'd be different. It wouldn't be city council doing the interviews for like three minutes and trying to go through 22 boards. You know, and a, it, this is a chance for water board active members to be part of the review process. So in the, in the months to come, we're gonna provide some more information as we, as we receive it. But um, wanted to kind of let that so that all board members can reach out to any of your constituents or people that you know that there's gonna be a new uh, position opened up because as it is right now, Todd, I think you've been with us now for 10 years if you can believe that or not. And uh, I think on water board, there's a two term limit. So the way it sets up right now, after two years or after two terms, a member would need to take, you know, a year off and then they would be eligible to reapply. But uh, just kind of wanted to bring that up for everyone. It's information. Okay, thank you, Wes. Any questions, comments? I'm not saying any. Okay, thank you. Um, next item, the informational items, water board correspondence. Um, there are some items in the um, packet. Any questions, comments on those? I'm not seeing any. Okay, we'll move on. Um, item 12, items tentatively scheduled for future board meetings, cash and lieu. We talked about that. We'll revisit it in March. Um, and any future water board agenda issues? I'm not seeing any comments. All right, um, our next meeting date is February 28th, 2022. It's the week after President's Day. Um, so mark your calendars for that. So anyway, with that, um, is there anything else anybody wants to add? I'm not seeing any, so I'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, we'll see you all later. See you guys. Thank you.